All right, we are live. My name is Jamie J. I'm the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. And as I like to say, that's not why we're here today. I don't know if I like to say that, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> this is Live with Bottleneck. And today we're going to be talking with Jason DeFilippo, the living legend, the living podcast legend, as uh, our mutual friend Christopher Lockhead likes to say. So, Bear with us. We will be right back. Start coming on in. Be prepared to ask questions, whether you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, wherever you're at. If you have any questions about podcasting, Jason is the person you need that will definitely have the answer. And we'll be back in about 38 seconds. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, we are back. We are live with Bottleneck. That is me, Jamie J. I'm the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. And today we're going to be talking with the one and only the legend, uh, Jason DeFilippo. We're going to talk about podcast production and editing. Basically, we're here to talk about all things podcast. So if you have any questions around the wonderful world of podcasting, let us know. And why are we talking to Jason DeFilippo? We're talking to Jason DeFilippo because he's an award-winning podcast producer, editor, and host. He's the co-creator and co-host of the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast. Jason's past and current clients include The Tim Ferriss Show, you might know who that is. The Jordan Harbinger Show, you might know who that is. And of course, uh, the legendary Follow Your Different with Christopher Lockhead, as well as Lockhead and Marketing, the Kevin Rose Show, the Gladiator Way, Food List, and the Forbes List, and more. And before retiring from technology in 2013, Jason helped build and launch over 250 websites for major corporations like Paramount Pictures, Sony, Warner Brothers, and Disney, as well as several startups in San Francisco, including Technorati and 8020 Media, the publishers of JP Magazine and Statistical Aggregator Metrically. I said that without even stuttering. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Jason also created the two-time uh, SXXW, that's South by Southwest weblog award-winning web service blog rolling, as well as co-founded the Global Blog Network Metro Blogging. So without any further ado, please allow me to introduce Mr. Jason DeFilippo. What's happening? Oh, what's going on, Jamie? I, I, I'm, I'm so stoked uh, to, to have you here. Um, you and I have uh, met through a, a friend of ours, Christopher Lockhead, and it's just uh, an honor and privilege that you took the time to uh, show up today and talk a little podcasting with us. Dude, it's an honor for you to have me here. I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited to chat about podcasting. That's, that's well, I'm wondering, part. yeah, for, I don't know how, that many people that, that would be into podcasting that wouldn't know about you, but can you tell us a little bit of yeah, you'd be your surprised. background? And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, well, I mean, you pretty much covered it. I'm kind of tired just listening to my bio at this point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was a technology professional for uh, 20 some odd years. And then I've always been into podcasting because some of my friends were the, you know, the originators of podcasting. I knew Dave Weiner and uh, uh, my friend Kevin Marks, who were like, you know, integral back in the day. And I always like followed it and was always on the side of it, but I never got into it. And uh, finally, I met Jordan Harbinger and I was listening to his podcast and was doing technical work for him. And I, I engineered myself out of a job and I'm like, OK, well, I guess we're done now. I've, I fixed everything. And uh, we, but we would stay up late at night and talk gear and podcasts, the podcast we liked and all that stuff. And don't mind the dog behind me. He's uh, he's just getting comfy. Uh, <laughs> but then he um, he invited me to be his producer. And I'm like, sure, let's go. And that was right when he was at like episode 500 with Robert Green and just started to get serious about it. So he and I like doubled down and built his show up to, uh, you know, epic proportions and spent several years doing that. And then 
when I was doing that, I'm like, ah, oh, I should start my own show. So that's when my co-host Brian Schulmeister and I started Grumpy Old Geeks a little over seven years ago. And we just recorded episode 450 this morning. So, and uh, yeah, it's congratulations. Been, uh, oh, thank you. It's been a kind of a crazy ride, you know? Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, it, it, to be honest, uh, there's so many podcasts out there. It's hard to really know of all of them, let alone the new up and coming and all of that. And there's only a certain amount of time in a day. So, yeah. My bad. I'd never even listened to Grumpy Old Men until about two months ago. Well, it's Grumpy Old Geeks. Grumpy Old Men. Grumpy, Grumpy, old, Grumpy old Geeks. I'm sorry. Grumpy Old Geeks. <laughs> That's a wrong show, man. Yeah. yeah. Grumpy Old Geeks. <laughs> and and I got to tell you, it's a it's a great show. You guys have a you, – you you guys are talking. You get along. You can tell there's good chemistry. And and that's not easy to, to find these days because when you have more than just one person, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got calendars and scheduling and – different uh backgrounds and personalities uh, it sounds to me like you guys get along pretty well yeah i met brian in 1995 and we were working at the same company doing website design and we were just friends for forever since then and when i was ready to start a podcast i was trying to find a co-host and trying to find an angle and we just kept we had a standing date at finn mccool's in San, in santa monica we would just go have beers and sandwiches and talk tech and we would talk for four hours every time having beers and just getting loaded and having a good time and i'm like okay you're my guy oh that's <laughs> awesome and then we just kind of went from there so i mean we we our original premise was if we don't make money in 10 episodes we're gonna quit it oh. took us to it took us to episode 150 before we made a dime <laughs> i spent probably a, like a couple grand on equipment and hosting and all that stuff before we made a penny and it just it, it was one of those things where we just love doing it. So, you know, we just kept on with it. And now it's a pretty, pretty successful show. So I'm, I'm happy with it. And we're, you know, we're doubling down on it and making it even more successful now. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Uh, th that that gave me three things just out of what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a thing that's known as pod fade. And maybe you can define that for everybody. And by the way, if you're watching right now or listening and you have a question, Ask away. Put it in the mm -hmm. comments there. I'll put it up here, and Jason will be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, but going into that, one of the things I, I I picked up is a lot of people, they have this thing called pod fade. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could define that for people and tell us what that is. Well, I've never liked that term. I've never liked the term pod fade. In, in normal parlance, it would be called quitting. They mm. quit. It's just they quit. They they have a podcast and most people don't make it past 13 episodes. Everybody's going to shoot you a metric. And just after my years and years of listening to podcasts and watching people and everything, 13 episodes is generally the cutoff point for people who's like, they can power through six or seven, maybe get to 10, they get to 13 and then they just run out of stuff to talk about. That's the biggest issue. They like, they start a podcast, they think they know everything about their topic, and then they just run out of stuff to talk about, or they figure out that, oh, podcasting's hard. I'm going to have to work at this and you know spend a lot of time on it, and I'm not going to make any money for a long time uh, while I'm building my audience. And you know, that's why I, just, I don't like the term pod fade because it doesn't mean anything. It's just, okay, it means you quit your podcast. Right. It's called quitting. You just quit. You gave up, you know? So... Uh, that's, that's, that is my definition of pod fade. It's just quitting and giving up. And generally a lot of people should quit because they didn't think it out before they started and they didn't have a plan for long-term, you know, just long-term growth and what they were going to do. They just didn't have the chops to do it. And that's fine. I bet it was a fun experiment. They had a great time. They learned something. I don't begrudge anybody that starts a podcast and gives it up wouldn't do that you you got to try like mm -hmm. if it's something that kudos to you because it's not easy so it, you said yourself it took you quite a while till you made your first dime and, and you in, in the beginning you said hey i'm gonna do this for 10 episodes we don't make any money we're gonna call it quits mm -hmm. it just How it turned did you out overcome that, that well it just turned out that brian and i really like doing it it was fun you know, because he comes from the music business. I come from the film and entertainment and startup business. So we had different points of view on everything. And we fought a lot. And fighting is fun. You know? <laughs> fighting is fun. As long as you're respectful. As long as yeah. you're respectful. Yeah, and, respectful uh, fighting. 
And it was just something new for us because we, you know, we'd been in that business for, you know, each of us at 20 plus years. He ran his own business. I was a contractor and an employee and all that. And it was novel. It was really fun and something to do. And we really got a kick out of it, you know. And uh, that's, I think the thing is, you have to find the passion for what you're doing with a podcast or it's not going to last. You know, if, if you wake up and you don't want to do a podcast, podcasting is not for you. Yeah. Well, what were some of the things that you've taken from your experience that you thought was the right thing in the beginning, but ended up being the wrong thing to do and had to switch it to make it work? Uh, crappy gear, just because you can buy crappy gear, uh, it, it's going to be a hindrance for you. We spent, mm -hmm. I spent thousands of dollars like stepping up. I'm like, okay, we're going to start with uh, I hate to say it. We started with a Blue Yeti and uh, an Apogee mic. And those were the two mics we had. And they were god awful. And then we started moving up. And then we got road, uh, road podcasters. God awful. Yeah, you got one. I got one over here. It's right. It's, it's actually, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Eh, it's over there somewhere. It's a um, paperweight right now. <laughs> uh, well, actually, it's a prop because I'm going to, I'm trying to get to do a video on how oh. to properly use it because. Oh, there you go. The funny thing is. The Blue Yeti is a good mic, but nobody knows how to use it, and it's not meant for new podcasters. Um, it's a condenser mic, and it picks up a dog farting three houses down, if you don't know, you know. You have to be in a treated room. If you're in a treated room, and you know good vocal technique, and you know how to dial the knobs in, it is a beautiful sounding microphone. But for new podcasters who stick it in the middle of their dining room table, put all their friends around it, and everybody yells at it, it's worthless. It's worthless. You might as well use it as a paperweight. So, and then, you know, we just kept, I kept stepping up my gear, stepping up my gear. And it got to the point where I've, I mean, I've probably spent 10 to 15 or at least $15,000 getting to the level that I'm at right now. Oh, wow. If I would have just spent the money right now that I spent on this gear, I could have saved myself probably $13,000. I've got eh, maybe 10. I got a, I got a pretty decent rig here, but I went, to the good stuff. It's like, if you're going to jump in, jump in hot, get the good stuff for two reasons. One, you're going to sound better. You have to have good quality audio on a podcast nowadays. It's table stakes, period. But also, if you don't like podcasting, the higher end equipment has great resale value. So you're going to lose less money if you quit podcasting and need to offload your gear. Mm. So the, the junk that you buy is worthless. It's like, you know, you drive a car off the lot, it's worth nothing. That blue Yeti, I'll give you 15 bucks for it. So yeah. I can just throw it at somebody that I don't like, you know. <laughs> um, but I've got professional gear here. And if I wanted to, and I, I do often switch out gear, but the resale value on professional gear is extremely high. You know, and this microphone right now, I'm, I'm talking on an RE20. This is probably a $450 microphone new out of the box. If I wanted to sell this mic, I can probably get 400 bucks for it. Wow. You know, so oh, the resale huge. value on higher end gear is going to save you money in the long term. So if you're going to jump into it, jump into it big and get the good stuff. That's one of the lessons I learned. Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, Raina, Raina wanted to say hello. So she's hey, Raina. How's it going? <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to ask a question because that's it's important. You mentioned earlier dynamic. Or, or no, condenser. Condenser, condenser, Mike, yes. Can you tell me the difference between condenser and dynamic? Uh, well, I can't tell you the scientific differences because I don't have it in front of me. But the thing is, condenser mics are meant for studios and they pick up a lot of really nuanced noises. They're very, um, they're very sensitive. You know, like in a music studio, they always use condenser mics, like, you know, the really nice Neumanns and things like that, the $10,000 mics but they pick up a lot. The Blue Yeti does this weird thing where it, it changes the pattern on it based on where you're at in the room. Uh, dynamic mics like this one, they are focused. So you have a lot of, that's why you see these in radio stations. It's like, it points at you, it gets you. It doesn't get anything behind it, or it gets a little bit, but not much behind it. Uh, condenser mics just basically get everything in the room. That's why you need a treated room, a soundproof room that is meant for audio. These dynamic mics, I can be in a hurricane, point this thing at my face, and I can still get a good show out of it. Mm. Um, there, there, there are different types of uh, patterns that you can get with different mics, but 
for new podcasters, you want a dynamic mic. Even if you get like a cheap USB mic, like a Samson Q2U or an AT, uh, now it's a 2100X or an AT, uh, ATR 2100X or an AT2005. Those are good mics. You can actually make yourself sound like you're in a studio with those. They're wow. fantastic in there. Um, like the Samson QTU will run you about 60 bucks. The 2005 will run you about 70 bucks, but the new, uh, ATR 2100X is close to a, it's basically close to a hundred bucks. And the only real difference is that it has USB C and it's a little Mm. heavier, not, not a whole lot of difference between that and the old ATR 2100. But those are great starter mics. If you, if you don't want to go the full Monty and buy the big gear, but I'm going to tell you right now, you buy that mic, you're keeping it for life because nobody's going to want to buy it off of you for less than 20 bucks. Yeah. And Raina wanted to know what the brand of your dynamic mic was. Uh, mine is an Electrovoice RE20. You can see these in every uh, radio station in the world. Yeah. So how, how, what what do you need besides a microphone? Uh, it depends on what uh, what kind of microphone you get. If you get a USB mic, you just need your laptop. If you get a dynamic mic like this, that's an XLR mic, you're going to need an interface. So you're going to need an interface to take the analog signal from this, turn it into electrical signals, and then plug it into your computer. Uh, So you need some kind of interface. There are tons of interfaces out there. Um, A lot of new podcasters by the Focusrite series, the red ones. You've seen these, right, Jamie? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Yeah, they look like a little box like this. Yeah, just a little tiny box. There's a ton of those. You can get those from PreSonus or other, you know, other vendors. I'm not a fan of those because the uh, the amplifiers on them are not very good. And the amplifiers are they take the signal from the microphone, turn it into, you know, um, basically like amplify the electrical signal from the microphone, turn it into something that the chip can read and then turn that into uh, electrical signals, uh, digital signals that go to your computer. You spend 100 bucks on one of those, you're going to get 100 bucks worth of quality. Um, but it's the, the nice thing about it is you don't have to spend a lot more than that to really get a better uh, interface with better what we call preamps that take that signal and jump it up. Um, I mean, you can get something that is like almost studio quality for about $600, which would be like a, um, a Mix Pre 3. The Mix Pre 3 mm. is a fantastic... Uh, piece of gear and that thing has amazing resale value i use a mix pre six because i need more inputs but if you're just doing a two-person show mix pre threes are my that's what i recommend everybody get if you're going to get xlr mics uh not you know the usb mics and you want to do something that sounds amazing those things sound incredible and your podcast is going to just i mean it's it's going to make your podcast sound so much more professional so there, this is a longstanding, uh, I don't even know if it's an argument, but people that are getting started, there's there's people that go on to Zoom and use Zoom with their guests. And then there's people that go on and they, you know, they they get into this thing and they, they you know, I'm, I'm wondering what would you suggest for somebody getting started? And, and, and mind you, I'm the person that says, don't do the graphic design myself, hire out and get the graphic pre- design professionally done, right? Uh-huh. Um, because it's your brand. It's it's mm-hmm. who you are. And, and for me, I want to try and put out the best I possibly can, but sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Right. Um, so I, 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 what's, what is actually the question? I'm trying to make it sure. The, the question is, um, some people use zoom some mm-hmm. people use different things what would you recommend that someone getting started is it okay to use zoom buy a usb microphone and start doing that on zoom or w- would you recommend an alternative route and yeah, by the way would... michael hernandez says hello fe- fellas hey michael <laughs> hey michael uh i would never recommend zoom for a podcast ever their audio quality is terrible i recommend squadcast.fm uh, they do a fantastic job. It's not very expensive, and you get studio quality because you get the remote microphone uh, live from your remote guest. I mean, honestly, I always recommend being in the room. I prefer everybody be in the room, but in nowadays, obviously, that ain't going to happen. So yeah. when you're doing remote shows, to start off with, Squadcast.fm is my go-to. Love those guys. Uh, if you listen to Grumpy Old Geeks, the past 150 episodes have been on Squadcast. You cannot tell we're not in the same room. Yeah, it's fantastic. And Frank Sell, uh, the bearded baby beard oil. Uh, Frank Sell says <laughs> always, always. I'm assuming he's saying always too. 
not doing Zoom or to yeah. use this broadcast. Yeah, Zoom is a terrible idea. You see so many people using that now because they just don't know how to do remote shows because uh, they're always used to being in the studio. And uh, Squadcast is my go-to. Love those guys. And uh, it always gives you the best that you're going to get. Fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the, some of the other things that, that uh, you look at for people that are starting out, um, how do you know how to come up with a good show topic to, to differentiate yourself? Uh, that's one of the things where you need to find a, you need to create a show that it doesn't exist that you want to hear. You know, it's like, do your research, sit there and, well, I guess it's not iTunes anymore, but sit there in Apple podcasts and search, do a lot of searching, do a lot of listening. I've listened to over 10,000 podcasts, you know, in the first five years of me podcasting, because I wanted to hear what everybody was doing and figure out how to differentiate my show from what everybody else is doing. It's like, you know, right now, the big Apple event just came out. We don't talk about Apple because everybody else is doing it. We don't have to. It's like, you know, take the burden off yourself to let everybody else talk about where everybody else is. Be on the side. You want to be on the side of the room. You want to find your niche and uh, niche down, as our friend Chris would say, and really find a place where you can be the show that nobody else can listen to. You want to create that. That's what you're looking for. So when you're when you're really getting into the, the show creation phase, I say just look for what's out there and find out what's been done before. And like as we were talking before about pod fading, a lot of ideas have been done. You know, there are a million podcasts in iTunes. Most of them don't exist anymore. That doesn't mean they weren't good ideas. Somebody's life circumstances might have changed, but they might have had your idea. Take it and run with it if they're not producing anymore. If you want to produce the content that you want to produce, it doesn't mean that it was a bad idea. It means that something could have happened to them. They may have had a kid, you know, they may have, they might've been run over by a beer truck. You have no idea what happened to these, these people in their shows. But if there is a currently running show that is like yours that you want to do, if it's not as good as the show you think you can do, well then eat their lunch, go for it. But if theirs is better than what you think you can do, then maybe back off and rejigger and find another idea. That's really, really sage advice. It's, um, it's one of those things don't don't do this too lightly like don't rush into this thing do your research plan it and and uh talk to jason de filippo talk to some other people out mm -hmm. there and and maybe talk to um other people in the industry and maybe get some feedback initially i have to tell you the first podcast i started i didn't talk to anybody i just started it mm -hmm. with the it plugged in it's it was terrible Oh, there, you, trust me. Your first podcast is always going to be terrible. That's that. That comes with experience. I mean, you gotta you gotta work into that. But was the idea good? Was it sound? Well, I think it was good, but I think it was like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a uh, you know it was a marketing type deal, and you know, I I really didn't go into it with a lot of planning. I just thought I'm going to do a podcast, and this that was seven years ago. Right. Right. But I I did enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I really did enjoy it. I got to meet a lot of cool people. <laughs> Um, yeah. well, Frank Sell said he just started Home of the Hustle podcast recently. Well, congratulations to you. Congrats, bravo, and, bravo. And if do you have any specific questions for Jason, um, you've got him here. Ask away. He is the man when it comes to this stuff. And I do I have wanna, say, I, I want to follow up on that just a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Um, don't be afraid to start a podcast to experiment either. Like I started a show called uh, Does It Have Legs? It's a, it's a show where you take a 20-year-old movie, we watch it, and figure out if it has legs so you don't have to go back and watch it to find out if it's any good. I started that show because I wanted to figure out, because I didn't know how to do this, how to do a three USB microphone show on a Macintosh without buying like a mixer or anything like that. And it was, a it was like a technology play to figure out how to do that, but also I wanted to find out if new and no noteworthy was BS. Because I had a really big inkling because everybody was saying, you got to get into new and noteworthy because that's the place to be. And I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't think the numbers work out for that. I don't think that many people are going to iTunes and looking for new and noteworthy. So it was a double tiered experiment. A, I figured out how to use three microphones on USB on a Macintosh. Uh, pro tip, don't do it. It's a pain in the butt and you got to use GarageBand and it's, it's, a, it, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Buy a mixer, get some XLR mics. Second, I found out that indeed new and noteworthy was garbage because we got the number one spot in new and noteworthy 
in I, I can't remember if it was movies or comedy, but we sat there for six weeks, which is what the the run was. When we were done, I didn't I didn't put it anywhere else. Didn't tell anybody about it. We just had it in iTunes and new and noteworthy. When we were done, we had fifty subscribers. That was wow. it. Fifty. And after the like the next couple of weeks, that dropped off to about twenty. So new and noteworthy turned out to be complete and utter garbage. So that was an experiment. And we just did that show to try things out. It was also a great excuse to hang out with my buddies once a week and watch a movie and get drunk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so there was, That's okay, there cool. were three, three points to that, but yeah. That is cool. Well, you know what? What do you say when, when people bring up, and by the way, I, I do have to say hi to Scott Sprinkles. He's, uh, he's, he's my slip neighbor down at the, uh, <laughs> down, down there at the docks there in Table Rock. So good to see you, Scott. Um, uh, what do you say about social proof? Social proof does work. So the ratings and reviews work to a point. You want to not have five reviews on your show. You want to have 500 reviews on your show. Once you hit like the 500 or 1,000 mark, give up. It's done. You're done. That's it. That's all you need. Um, so you don't want to ask for ratings and reviews unless there's a reason for it. Like on Grumpy Old Geeks, we ask for ratings and reviews because we read them on the show. And we tell people to write something funny. Leave us a snarky review. And... It, that way it gets read on the show and it gives us content. But when it comes down to like actually getting reviews for the sake of like bumping yourself up in the algorithm so you're in the top or whatever, um, that doesn't really matter. The, um, the top charts absolutely matter. If you can get in the top 200 on any chart, mm -hmm. that matters because that is a proof point that you can use to either get more guests, get better advertisers, or just you know prove that your show is not just you know, a dude in a garage like me, I'm in a garage, but, uh, <laughs> um, it, it, that, that kind of social proof helps when it comes to the, the rankings and the ratings, but the, well, well the, Mark Maron was in a garage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look how it turned out for him. Yeah. I guess, I guess he got all the juice out of it because this garage ain't, it ain't magic. It ain't magic. <laughs> well, that's good advice. Uh, we have uh, Aaron Wexler. He said he just started his podcast within the game, which is about inspired living for athletes, coaches, and entrepreneurs. And he goes on to say he'd like to know the best way to promote his show. Thanks for the question, Aaron. All right. Best way to promote your show is to have an audience before you start a show. So start with that. You know, if you have a built in audience already, that's the best way to start. Um, the next best way is get on other podcasts, do uh, show swaps with people or ad swaps. So you have somebody that has a show like yours, cross promote, do 30 second spots and just trade them. So people get introduced to you through their audience and vice versa. Uh, paid advertising always works. You can always pay to be on other people's shows, buy ad spots on there if you have a budget. Um, and that really does work. You know, sometimes you got to pay to play. I bought, I've, you know, spent thousands of dollars on ads for Grumpy Old Geeks and it works. It gets you in front of the people that normally wouldn't see your show. Um, posting on your own social about your show, you're, it's an echo chamber. It doesn't matter. They're already listening to your show. Um, but yeah, getting out there and engaging with the community that's like yours and either paying them to play spots from your show or, you know, buying ads. Uh, Facebook ads do not work for podcasts. It's been proven time and time again. Being in front of people who already have a podcast player. Oops, sorry, I was shaking the table. <laughs> <It's> earthquake. <laughs> I am in Southern California, it happens. Um, you want to be in front of people who have a podcast player in their hand so they can go, oh, that show sounds good. Let me search. Okay, subscribe. Done. That's what you want. Um, so... I mean, that's the route that I basically focus on now when I'm doing any kind of podcast promotion. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Aaron did say thank you. And he had a follow up. He said, do you recommend email marketing blasting your personal contacts? I wonder how similar that is to social media. Uh, personal contacts, you're just going to annoy your friends. Uh, let them know it exists, but don't harp on it. Almost nobody that I'm friends with listens to my show. That's fine. My family doesn't even listen to my show. It might not be their cup of tea. So, you know, you can bug them once, but don't harp on it. Um, email marketing, I've, I haven't seen that much uptick with it. You know, uh, I did a show for a guy. I'm not going to name him. He had a basically had an email list of about 350,000 people. 
every week he would blast out his latest episode with all the subscribe links, all the show notes, and he had about 15,000 subscribers to his show. So that should tell you what the power of email marketing does to promote a podcast. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, it, it, it's kind of like a, it's, it seems it's a hit or miss thing. I don't think there's any proven formula for that because I think different audiences, different things, right? Mm-hmm. They respond differently. Yeah. Um, and I say, test it out. Like you said, maybe get out there and get on other people's podcasts and just start getting the word that way. Borrow other people's audiences. Yeah, that's what you have to do. And let them borrow yours. You know, exactly. That, that's what you have to do. It's like, okay, look, if we have a similar show, here's what's going to happen. They're going to listen to both of them. You're not going to lose your audience because somebody likes your both of your content. If your content's similar, they're going to listen to both of them. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way it works. I've seen this time and time and time again. People are like, no, but I don't want them to know that, you know, I don't want my audience to know this guy exists because he might be better than me. So I'm going to let him advertise on my show and suck my audience away. That never happens. It never happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to the half hour, so I want to respect your time. There's a ton more questions that I can ask, too. And by the way, Aaron does want one more. He goes, do you recommend a YouTube video version of your podcast? I already know. I think I know how you're going to answer this. But yeah. he does. He He's asking, you know, YouTube, do you do video and audio? Uh, I'll tell you in a second. But uh, I had an hour book. So if you need to keep going, I'm fine. Oh, OK, right on. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, the the YouTube version of your podcast, it is it depends. It totally depends if you already have a YouTube audience who knows you. Uh, fine, do it. If you do not have a YouTube audience, do not waste the time. Do not waste the money. Do not waste the effort. The ROI, if you do not already have a built-in audience on YouTube, is zero. Uh, it's actually negative because you're going to waste time on it. You're going to waste money on it. And you're not going to build an audience on YouTube. I mean, look at YouTube versus po- podcasts. There are 1 million podcasts. There are 20 million channels on YouTube. You are going up against a behemoth if you are going to try and get your content onto YouTube and think you're going to move the needle. It just doesn't work. The search is, you know, you're going up against giants over there. And I've seen it time and time again. I've seen people waste tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars thinking that setting up video and doing this on YouTube for their podcast is going to move the needle and um, say, uh, you know, personal uh, just um, I, I've seen people with 200,000 audience, 200,000 download per episode audiences put their show on YouTube and get anywhere from seven to 10,000 downloads on YouTube. So look at that differential, that money that you just spent filming it, editing it, the time that you spent, and then promoting it on YouTube. If you'd have spent that money promoting your audio version, which is where people want to watch, pod, listen to podcasts, you would have been so much farther ahead of the game. People, like, people always say, but Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan comes from TV. It's a different beast. It is a totally different beast. So... You can't you can't compare you know apples and kumquats. It just doesn't work. Um, but feel free to try, and you know you can drop me an email at j- jpd.me when you figure out I'm right. But <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Michael Hernandez says more podcast storms, please. I, I no, think he's referring to pod storms. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> We're still <laughs> recovering from that. So, uh, I, tell tell us. Uh, I, I know we talked with Christopher. Um, for for those of you that that don't know, um, Jason was very instrumental in uh, the very first Podstorm ever, uh, which was kind of like a lightning strike of sorts. If you're familiar with Play Bigger, um, but it was it was 30 days, 30 episodes, and it was uh, it was challenging, I guess to say the least, but. Um, you want to tell them a little bit more about what a pod storm is? A pod storm is basically you take what your normal content would be, like say you do one a week, and then you just compress it and do a ton of podcasts in a row. So everybody gets new content every single day. 
um, Chris came to me and said, hey, what do you think? Oh, actually, you were on the call, too. It was, it was the three of us. We did this together. So I'm not alone in in, <laughs> in my blame for this. He's like, hey, what do you think of this idea? Like on paper, it sounded fantastic. Let's do it. And then, you know, then we had then the rubber had to meet the road. And it was just like, oh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> so, it was a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It, I think it, I think it, it did. It, it did do well yeah. uh, in terms of. Uh, more listeners and, you know, mm-hmm. more questions and more, you know, it, it created a buzz of sorts. And, and that mm-hmm. aspect, I think good 30 days, maybe a little long. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, I've got a, all of us have a body of work that we can be incredibly proud of now. So hundred percent, hundred percent. We'll go back to Aaron. Uh, he's, he's, he's really excited about this. He says, how many episodes should I have backlogged? And what are your thoughts on using Anchor to push the episodes out? Okay, on how many episodes you should have backlogged, that depends on the frequency of release on your show and how timely your show needs to be. So if you're doing a, you know, a news show, well, zero. You should have zero episodes backlogged because it needs to be timely. If you're doing evergreen content, uh, as many as you want, you know, I, you, as many as you can, you know, have that stuff backed up, batch it, you know, do five episodes a, in a day. So you have five weeks worth of content and then you, you know, do it again later on. That saves your sanity. That's for sure. Um, but it, it really depends on the frequency of your release, the type of show that you have and how much effort you want to put in up front. It does give you a lot of breathing room, though. I will tell you that. Um When I was doing, excuse me, pardon me. Uh, When I was doing the Jordan Harbinger show, we would try and be almost a month ahead. We would have three weeks minimum in the can because we've been down that road where it's like, it's Tuesday, we've got advertisers and we have no content. Who can we call to make a show? And trust me, you never want to be in that position if you're you're running a professional show where you have advertisers. Um, But... It's yeah, it's just as far ahead as you can kind of get, I'd, I'd say, is the best place to be. Uh, that's you know, that's just my two cents. As far as anchor, no, do not use anchor, uh, use a paid service so you own your content and you own your feed. Uh, Libsyn is my go to, uh, cool. Grumpy Old Geeks hosts on Art 19 because we need more professional tools, so you have to pay for bandwidth there, so it's a higher cost, but uh. The Libsyn $20 package is what I tell everybody to start with. You get pro stats, you get more than enough file space to post a decent sized show, and it's 20 bucks and it's unlimited bandwidth. There is no better deal in professional podcast hosting than personally, I say Libsyn, but that's that's uh, my two cents. Yeah, well, I agree with the big thing I agree with is own your assets. Yeah, absolutely. You need to be able to move that feed when you want, you know, you can't get mad if you put up a tent in somebody's backyard and they turn the sprinklers on and ruin your picnic, you know? Oh, I got, Oh my gosh. There were some, there's some nightmares that have been, <laughs> it's the same reason why I tell people not to do Squarespace or anything like that. Like get, get your own site, get your own hosting yep. Own yep. The content. <laughs> I prefer. Yeah. If you're going to build a website, I prefer node host. I think it's node host.ca. Uh, those guys have some of the cheapest hosting you can get. Uh, they're fantastic with customer support, and you just not believe how how cheap you can get a, a you know a virtual machine up there. And they're they're Canadian, so they're awesome. Yeah, and uh, Aaron, absolutely no problem. Man. He ask says, away, right, man. Yeah. That's that's what Jason's here for. I mean, it, it, ask away. Um, and in keeping with that, Andrew mm-hmm. uh, Wang, thanks for asking this question. For impact and execution, do you recommend doing a week a one week pod storm? Good enough. Yeah, I think so. Better than a 30 day. That's for damn sure. <laughs> uh, but I think I think a one week pod storm, if you're if you're already posting two to three times a week. No, that's just a few extra episodes. But if you do like once a week and then you want to do like a five fiver, uh, go for that. And it also depends on the length of the show. Jamie, you and I discussed this. Mm. Pod storms need to have short episodes. You cannot put out five hours of content in a week and not expect to lose people, you know? Yeah. And that, that's true. I mean, the short and I mean, everybody's busy. Maybe mm-hmm. a pod storm is it can be even adjusted from your regular form. I mean, I don't know. Is that I, I shouldn't say anything. I should ask you, is it OK to move away from your regular format during a pod storm in order to keep the show shows or that or that episodes? Sorry, shorter. 
I absolutely, I think so. I think what a, I think each episode in the pod storm should be a distillation of what you normally do and just put it out boom, 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 boom. You know, so if you're doing a one hour interview with somebody and you have five interviews, take those five interviews, take 15 minutes, take the best 15 minutes from those interviews and put them in the pod storm. And then later on down the line, release the full episodes over time. You know, mm. like if you're doing an interview show, that's I just came up with that. I think that would work. Uh, I'm thinking <laughs> on my feet here. Um, but I think that would be a really cool way to it's even just like a doing a preview. It's like, OK, this is like, you know, 10 minutes with this guy, 10 minutes with this gal and boom, 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 you know, for that. And then what you what you then have speaking to the having episodes in the can, if you already have this stuff done. You, you just you just burned a week of content. You can have ad spots on five different shows or CTAs on five different shows. Then you've got, after that, five weeks of content where you can go to the Bahamas and chill and then come back and start Stuff over again. Stuff is still cranking. And yeah. by the way, CTA stands for call to action. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if maybe if I can uh, – actually, Aaron has another question here. I don't want to forget this. I'll hold on, Aaron. I'm going to ask your question in just a second. Um. Should people have sponsors or should people have calls to action on their podcasts? Uh, well, sponsorship is kind of a call to action. Um, I mean, you can have a call to action to sign up for my email list or you know whatever. But um, I am a fan of every single show. As soon as you start, start with some kind of either sponsorship or advertisement. I've worked in the web world for 20 plus years. I know that if you start a free site and then eventually charge for it, your audience, you're going to, you're going to be down to 5% of what your audience originally was. You know, when, once you go behind the quote unquote paywall, the mentality is the same with podcasting. If people get used to your show being free and not having any kind of interruptions in it for sponsorship, when you start to, when you start to put that stuff in, it is going to piss people off. Mm. So I say everybody, even if it's just for Joe's, you know, house of pancakes down the street from you, or better yet, some kind of affiliate program that you can get revenue on down the line that is, you know, consistent with the theme of your show. Do it. Absolutely do it. We made that mistake on Grumpy Old Geeks, and I've learned from it, and I've, I've seen it countless times since then. So find an affiliate. Like on Grumpy Old Geeks, we use private internet access. So if you need a VPN, go to gog.show slash VPN. And uh, <laughs> o over time, over time, that built up revenue without having to do anything and not having any you know formal contracts in place for them paying for the show. So it wasn't an, a, an actual sponsor of the show, but it generated revenue for us. And now just on the residual revenue from private internet access, because we get re re renewals on that. We made and what was that again? Private internet access. Yeah, but they, where, they, where do they go to get that? Oh, GOG.show slash VPN. Uh, <laughs> um, but trying to find an, an affiliate that gives you residual income over time is fantastic, and it lets you put in an ad slot in your show, even if it's just um, uh, like a, was it a... Um, cost per action, like a CPA mm -hmm. uh, affiliate where you get paid when somebody signs up, it's fine too. You'll make some money on it, but you'll also be training your audience to know that there are going to be advertisements in this show at some point. Don't overburden them with them. You know, find the sweet spot on where they should go. I, I am not a fan of pre-roll advertising. I know our friend Chris Lockhead is. I know Joe Rogan is. I know a lot of people are. I don't prefer pre-roll advertising because I want people to get into the show. Mm -hmm. I want to give them something before I ask them to give me something. That's just my methodology. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> but, Wait. um, oh, go ahead. I, I, well, I didn't want to interrupt your thought there, uh, but I'm thinking too, there is, in, in my opinion, there is something to be said for coming in and starting off the top of that particular episode with a little nugget, kind of a kind of like sending out some, hey, get ready. This is what we're doing today. But go to, you know, <laughs> you know, da 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 da, you know, to get this da 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 da, play your intro and say, then come back, right? Wouldn't you do you do you like that aspect of it? Because I well, Chris does that. I do like that. Chris does it. What you don't take into account with that are new listeners. New mm. listeners are coming to your show <clears throat> all the time, and this new listener is not going to do anything. And then it's like, okay, you just wasted 30 seconds of their time with this, you know, begging for, like, this is what this is. 
new people coming to your show are going to be like, well, what's, what's the show? And they might just you know, delete you before they even get to the show. That's why I'm such a huge fan of getting to the meat of the show as fast as you can. Mm. You can, you know, like I said, it's different, you know, different religions when it comes to this stuff. Uh, just from my experience, I found that that really works well for mm. me. Sweet. Well, and I think now's a good time to pop up Aaron's next question. It says, should you have a website with show notes with an opt-in form for email capture? Uh, I don't do email capture because I'm terrible at marketing, as Chris will tell you. Um, <laughs> I think every every show should have a website. Absolutely. Because you want you want a place where people can go that you can do upsells for them or capture their email addresses. I think everybody should have a you know simple website. And it just gives you another option to sell to them later, no matter what the show is. <clears throat> Pardon me. Like on, um, and, and here's the other trick. This is a trick that I have tested and tested and tested, and nobody believes me. Nobody believes me, but nobody's willing to try and test it. If you go to, if you download uh, Grumpy Old Geeks, subscribe to it, it, there is basically one little block that says what the show's about, and under that, it says show notes at gog.show slash episode number period that's all you get in your player you can click on that you can get a web view and it's easy to remember and everything then is on that page and i spend a lot of time making those show notes you know pretty solid and because what i want them to do is go to my website period i don't want to duplicate content i don't want to spend the time putting it in the ID3 tags. I don't want to have to put it in the, you know, the interface for the hosting platform. I'm like, I want to put all of these show notes in one place. That's it. That way I'm not duplicating my time. I'm also getting people to my website where I can upsell them on different things and also, uh, you know, have the players and, and share buttons and things like that. So that is my methodology. We tested this on Grumpy Old Geeks a long time ago. We used to get about 3% of the people that listen to our show come to the website and check out the show notes. After I moved to this, about 20% of the people that listen to the show over the course of a week will come and check out the show notes on the website. That was, that's quantifiable. It's there. It works. So, but nobody believes me. I don't know why. <laughs> so, so the other thing that I think with show notes too, well, I, I believe you. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> uh, but with with show notes, it also offers optimization um, mm -hmm. more than just you know putting out the little audio player, which is great. But if somebody doesn't know who Jason DeFilippo is or mm -hmm. Grumpy Old Geeks, and they're typing in uh, a topic that you spoke about and you appear in the search results because your show notes were there and written out or transcription, and that's that should be another question: Do you write out? Uh, uh, show notes in, in kind of a narrative type form, kind of paraphrasing, or do you transcribe? Uh, I'm not a fan of transcription, but uh, I know a lot of people are. For what, you know, for the shows that I work on, transcription doesn't really work that well. I mean, we have a machine transcribed, and then we use them for the show notes on certain shows when it's a, when it's a long form interview or things like that. And there's a lot of different topics. Grumpy Old Geeks is a news show, so we have the title the player, the list of shows about us and all the different things and, you know, go buy our stuff, give us money, sign up for Patreon and all that stuff. Um, for the bigger shows like Tim Ferriss's show, I know they're doing transcriptions and they're doing very long form show notes because my friend Bob is the guy that does the show notes. Um, so it depends on the topic and the place, but the transcription stuff, um, it depends on your use case. Uh, for SEO, I have never heard anybody say that it, it does a damn thing. Uh, I don't know if you've if you've seen differently since you're you're Mr. SEO. Have you seen transcriptions for podcasts actually move the needle? No, nope. okay. I can't. well, and I, I should I should preface that by saying I've never tested um, in, in mm. deep, deep deep testing or anything. But I mean, you can write a 500 word paraphrase off the first five ten minutes of the episode where you're going to get the title and all the information about mm -hmm. that episode. And that seems to really do well. Yeah, does um, does the job. So, yeah, yeah. So why pay like you know eighty eighty or hundred bucks for you know a good transcription to put on your website when it doesn't? It's not going to pay it back. You know, that's just basic business. Great. And and Michael Hernandez. Hey, thank you so much. He says thanks for coming, buddy. 
uh, keep up the good work back to work he goes <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah and, and thanks again jason seriously for taking the time man this is this is fantastic stuff um in i i love podcasting uh, yep. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without podcasting. I mm -hmm. 100% believe in my heart of hearts that had it not been for this unbelievable medium, I wouldn't be where I'm at. And I think what's really powerful about it is, is number one, um, the globe is so much smaller now because of all this technology that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And it's so awesome to be able to share what it is that you're passionate about, talk about it, have conversations, do whatever it is and not be. And, and so that, you know, I got out of radio. Oh, I got into radio because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have so much freedom. I'm going to be creative. I got out of radio because there's so much red tape and lawyers and mm -hmm. you can't do anything. It's so you get into podcasting. It's like, oh, it's just open. Yeah up you can do whatever it is that you want to do in it so that's why i love podcasting and i love the fact that like i get to meet you had mm -hmm. i been in podcasting i would have never met christopher i would have never met you yep that's the great thing no rules and you meet so many great people that's it you know it's like i've met thousands probably tens of thousands of people through the shows that i've been on and you know it's like Every week, you know, thousands of people get to hear me and then they email me and I get to talk to them and I get, you know, it's like anywhere in the world I go now, I probably can find somebody to go hang out with and have a beer with. It's awesome. I love it. It really is. It's so cool. It yeah. definitely. Um, the Aaron, irony is I never leave my garage. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron has another question. He says, what's the, the best do-it-yourself editing software other than Garage Band? And, and before you answer that, he said, this is all great. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, well, all editing software is do it yourself. So <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you have to you need some kind of non-destructive editing. If you're on GarageBand, then I, I assume that you're on a Mac. I say drop the 300 bucks and get Logic Pro because it will make your life a lot better. GarageBand will give you headaches and waste your time. A program like Logic Pro will have the tools that you need to get the job done faster and easier. And I wish I'd have made that switch a long time ago. So uh, yeah. you want to you just want a really good non-destructive editor. Pro Tools, a lot of people use because, uh, you know, it's it's like the industry standard for music. I like Logic because I hate working in ugly software. And I think Pro Tools is pretty hideous. Uh, some people like Audition. I find it maddening and just impossible to use. Um, so my personal recommendation, what I use every day is I use Logic Pro. Mm. I, I, I love audition and, and, you know, I think maybe why is I don't come from that background. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but well, what back, what background from, from, uh, editing, high level production tech. Me I don't neither. Know. Oh, uh, didn't you say you were in websites for 20 plus years or something? I, like that? I was a backend developer. I wrote uh lamp stack. I was a, oh. you know, <laughs> Linux, Apache, MySQL, you know, PHP that, guy. That, I, I, that may understand the UX right? The, or yeah. the interface, user mm -hmm. interface there. Um, yeah. for, for me, I started on this um, in doing, uh, I think it was two, 2009, maybe? 2008. Mm -hmm. I started messing around with video editing and obviously Creative Suite, Adobe. And yep. that's how I learned. I learned all about the dynamic linking and it just got, it was easy for me. If that's what you know, stick with it, man. You know, yeah. You, that's where I started out. Yeah. If that's that's it, then there's no reason to switch. It all does the same stuff. All these DAWs do the same thing, you know. You can do, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, Andrew uh, Reaper. I've heard a lot of good things about Reaper. Hindenburg is interesting, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, there's, there's a ton of them out there, but the one that gets the job done the fastest for you that you don't want to tear your hair out at the end of the day, uh, that's the one I recommend, you know. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And that's where Andrew said, I switched from GarageBand to Reaper. Mm -hmm. uh, Reaches yeah. great time. It's also a cross platform. Yeah. And GarageBand is just a, it's a, it's a nightmare. Uh, and, and also don't use Audacity. I'm just going to tell you right now, don't use Audacity. I've never used it. Don't. It's terrible. It is terrible. You want, you want an interface from 1994? <laughs> go, go load up Audacity. It is the ugliest thing i've ever seen and it just it's <laughs> impenetrable i know and, and here's the why it's free you get what you pay for logic is 300 bucks and it makes my life 
happier every day. I load it up and I'm like, I'm at home. Like I, when I load Photoshop up, I'm at home. You know, those those apps that you really love. But uh, I open up Audacity and I'm like, I'm just thinking Windows 95 is going to crash any second. So <laughs> I hear you there. Um, well, before we end up wrapping up we've about four minutes to the hour here. Mm hmm. Um, how do people reach out and get in touch with you if they if they want to talk to you, if they want to learn more, if they want to learn from you, if they want to hire you, whatever? How do they reach out and talk to you? Well, you can always hit me up on Twitter. I'm at JPDef on Twitter. Instagram, I'm at, uh, at JPD, so you can always see my puppies there. You can see one behind me over there. I'm still sleeping. The big one's underneath me farting away. Uh, nothing like a 120-pound Rottweiler farts while you're trying to do a live stream. Um, my website's at jpd.me. Uh, I'm not taking new clients right now, but I am going to be um, working with some friends to get some basic classes up to, that we're going to be giving away. Um, there's going to be some more uh, higher end classes that we'll probably be charging for. But I'm going to I did a class one time on how to go from zero to podcast using Libsyn. And uh, I built that class in 11 hours. So I'm going to try and do it again and wow. get that out there for free uh, just so people can see how easy it is. You know, we, I, I started from nothing. I went from literally nothing and I showed them how to do show art, how to do show notes, how to do basic editing and all that good stuff. And uh, it was really popular. It was really popular. But then Libsyn changed their interface and I got a job. So I, have to, <laughs> I took that one down, but I'll have something new up soon, hopefully. That is one thing. It, it this this industry moves quick. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of updates that are coming up, and uh, Frank Sell just wanted to say great info. Thank you, oh, thank uh, you Frank. And Frank, congrats on starting your new podcast. Uh, that's a not an easy feat. Um, yeah. Before we wrap up, is there any words of wisdom or advice or anything else you'd like to say before we wrap? And then don't go anywhere. I won't. I'll stick we'll around. <laughs> uh, I'm, here's here's what I'm going to tell you. I tell this to everybody. You're going to suck at the beginning. It's going to sound terrible. You're going to hate the sound of your own voice. Practice, practice, practice. What I did at the beginning, I would read the newspaper. I would, I'd had my iPad and my microphone, and I would just read the newspaper. And then also listen to as many podcasts as you can. And don't listen to the same stuff you normally listen to. What I like to do is I like to go to the Apple uh, Top 200, and I'll pick five a week. And I'll just listen to random shows to get random points of view and hear what other people are doing, because that's going to broaden your horizons. You don't want to live in a bubble. You don't want to listen to the same shows that you always listen to and that you like. You want to get out of, you know, get out of your head, hear what other people are doing, because it's going to give you ideas. You're going to be like, oh, I really like this bit over here that they did on this show. I like this bit I, they did over here on this show and steal it. Just take it and incorporate it into your show because you're going to make something new from it. So that's what I really, really recommend is just, you know, broaden your horizons, work your butt off and practice, practice, practice. And also <clears throat> final one, I'm losing my voice here. <laughs> second show for the day. Um, <laughs> throw away your first three episodes, at least throw away your first three episodes because they're going to be garbage. You're getting your, you're getting your feet under you and, uh, you know, we did that on Grumpy Old Geeks and on a couple other shows. I think we threw away five episodes of Up to not Up to Speed. Up to Speed was my new show. Does it have legs? I have to look at my show art on the wall to figure out which shows I did. <laughs> uh, does it have legs? We threw away like the first five of them because they were they were garbage. So, wow. Yeah, uh, definitely do that. So there, I know it wasn't one nugget. There was a couple in there. So enjoy. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please, you know, I, and definitely go follow uh, Jason on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's, it's always entertaining. Uh, you're <laughs> not quite sure what you're going to get, um, but I absolutely love it. I'm a huge fan. Um, and almost yeah. everything I do is not family friendly. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I actually love it. It's it's a good time. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, and let me see. We got a couple more here. Frank Sell, Brad Kai. Oh, he's, he's tagging people to uh, thank you, uh, Frank, for letting other people know. And Andrew Wang says, thanks for the tips. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for showing up and, and uh, watching. It's been fun. It's been yeah. a ton of fun. This is good, man. Thank you for uh, throwing down the wisdom bombs. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge bombs. Knowledge. Well, hold on one quick second. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, right. 
be right back. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for uh, jumping on live with Bottleneck. My name is Jamie J, CEO and founder of Bottleneck Virtual Assistance. And as you know, I'm a big fan of podcasting. I absolutely love it. And to have someone like Jason DeFilippo stop by and uh, share with him, uh, share with you his thoughts uh, beside myself. I hope you get a lot out of this. If you have any questions, you weren't able to make it or you're watching this at, uh, in, as an evergreen uh, playing at a later time, reach out to him. Uh, ask away. He is good people, really good people to know. And another reason why I love podcasting so much is because of the unbelievable unbelievable people that you get to meet. And Jason is definitely uh, one of those unbelievable people. So thank you again to Jason DeFilippo. Go check out Grumpy Old Geeks. Uh, and uh, I'll let me see if I can pop that up here one more time so you can see where it is. Go check it out. Grumpy Old Geeks. I think it's right there. Have fun listening to the show. I know you're going to enjoy it. Uh, anything else? Thanks so much. And remember, make a ripple. Make a a ripple.